welcome back to another session of GCAN, Gallon Current Affairs and News Analysis. I have with me about 8 topics today. The first which we need to deal, discuss is about Chandrayaan 3 and its success. There is a lot of articles in the newspaper so I will be clubbing everything together. Then about uh, social security benefit scheme for unorganized sectors. Then the growing India-UK relationships and One Health scheme. Then we have some prelims. Astra air to air missile, national curriculum framework that is there is going to be a different set of framework for 10th and 12th board students. Then the Wagner group and one practice question. So Chandrayaan 3, you might all have seen the launch, uh, launch not the launch but the landing of Chandrayaan 3 yesterday. It was a spectacular view by which the, all the Indians like about 6 to 60 lakhs of Indians were watching it live. So today we will be discussing about what is the success what is going to be the future, not just of Chandrayaan 3 and what is the future of ISRO. So you see here, India is the fourth country to land on soft land on moon. After US, Russia and China, India is the fourth country to reach there. But if you look at, India was planning to long, long, land on South Pole. So India is the first country to actually land on the South Pole, that is the polar region of the moon. That is about 6, not 3 p.m. We actually landed yesterday and now there was a series of phase if you actually watched the video there was a series of phase which is going on you know the rough breaking phase altitude hold phase fine breaking phase and terminal descent phase you can see here this is how from the orbit the Chandrayaan 3 was descending in stage you can see the rough breaking space then altitude hold space then we have the fine breaking space and then the final termination and landing phase if you look in Chandrayaan 2, what happened is that the rough breaking space was okay. But when there was a problem, when they reached the altitude hold phase, there was a problem and Chandrayaan 2, we lost uh, the communications with Chandrayaan 2 and it crash landed to the moon. Now, we have actually completed all four stages and there was final landing on the south pole of the moon by which India became the first country to land in the south pole. And by this Vikram completed, that is Vikram lander completed about all these phases in 19 minutes and by 6 not 3 pm we actually landed in the moon. So in this Chandrayaan 3 there was actually, uh, India is now a member like if you are looking at the post of this, there is a success for India because as per we know there is Artemis mission from US, India is also a part of this. Now the success of Chandrayaan 3 actually puts India in a very significant position in the world order where India is now one of the leading, in, leading, uh, leading organization in the space sector. I, it makes ISR one of the leading spe spectators. Now India is now the member of this Artemis mission that is a US led mission to take humans to moon by 2025. So given the first that India has landed in, Chandra, uh, landed in the moon with Chandra and 3, it gives India a considerable position in the space world space organization. Now we know Luna 25 that of Russia actually failed. This Luna 25 was actually a uh, like combination not just of Russia but also that of China. It was a part of their uh, broader policy known as the International Lunar Research Station Program. Now they want to actually put up a research station that is nearer to the moon. So this Luna 25 was a critical part of this broader project of International Lunar Research Station Program of both Russia and China. Now because of the failure of Luna 25 there was a hold to this mission. Now all the data that we get from Chandrayaan 3. Uh, we can actually determine physically, chemically, whatever the soil, the atmosphere, the air, everything, especially to south pole of the moon. Now Chandrayaan 3, as you see, can see here, it had two parts. The one is the lander, which is called the Vikram, you can see here. This is the lander and within it there was a rover. This is called the Pragyan rover. Now this rover is the one which will be collecting all, this, uh, collecting all the samples which we could actually analyze in the future. Now the land and rover it has a mission life over one lunar day which means 14 days. This whole mission was for 14 days, the entire life mission is for 14 days. So with this they have actually two kind of uh, experimental setups. One is the laser induced breakdown spectrum that is uh, you can call it as the LEPS. It actually takes a quantitative and qualitative elementary analysis which can be actually used, uh, further used for mineralogical composition and their finding. Then we have the alpha particle x-ray spectrum which is to determine the elemental con uh, uh, elemental composition of the lunar soil the elements on the air and such 
So this is not something which you need to remember. I'm just stating as per the article. The main thing which you need to know is that Chandrayanthi successfully landed. There was two parts which we need to address here: the Vikram lander and the Pragyan rover. You should actually know the name of both these. And the mission life is about 14 days. Whereas Luna 25 was actually for a one year, it was longer phase than uh, Chandrayaan. So we need to also know what are the future of ISR, what are the other projects. We have a project called the X-ray polarimeter satellite, that's called the ExposeSat. Now there is a lot of, it's actually a polarimeter instrument in S-ray, which will actually let us know about some of the astronomical sources like the black hole the neutron star, the pulse wind nebula, this is to actually analyze this and get more detailed information of how this kind of stuff works. Then we have Aditya L1, I have taken this in my class detailedly. Aditya L1 is to actually place the satellite in the Lagrange point 1, this is where the point, a Lagrange point is a point where if you are taking two big mass bodies like sun and the earth, this Lagrange point is a place where there is a big gravitational attraction and the satellite can actually remain stably there. So this Aditya L1 is to study the sun, the corona, the solar uh, wind, uh, winds and cycles, such is what is done by the Aditya L1. Now we have also two more projects uh, like the Gaganyan mission in which we are actually planning to send humans like three humans to, uh, through the earth orbit about uh, seven days. Now our Gaganyan, the astronauts are actually trained by Russian themselves. Then we have the Lunar Polar Exploration Mission, it is LUPEX, this is actually in addition with Japan. So with the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA. JAXA. So that is the upcoming four uh, important projects that India have. You don't need to know in depth, but in Aditya L1 you need to know specific what are the facts and what are it for, what are the Lagrange points and even the Gaganyan mission is pretty much important in that fact also. So these are Gaganyan and Aditya, one, Aditya L1 is something which you need to learn more about too. Now the other need a well crafted social security net for all. So in this we will be actually talking about this author, there is a lot of facts in this but it's important that you actually learn two or three because this unorganized sector is very important and a lot of schemes has come to help these people who are in the unorganized sector. Now presently about approximately 91 percentage of the workforce are in the working in the informal sector. They don't even have to ha access to social security. So what is the social security talking about? You, they don't have access to pension, they don't have any insurance, specifically they don't have health insurance. If they have an accident, they don't have that kind of insurance. If they don't work, they take a leave, they don't get paid for that. So that is what the informal sector means that they don't have any social security benefits. Now if you are post taking about 20 years, 20 years going 20 years, then India will be in an aging society. So this 91 percentage of the population will be aged, which means that they still don't get access to any pension and even in their old age they are made to work to be in a livelihood. We also bought in the code of social security 2020, but it doesn't specifically actually apply to any informal sector. So that is what the author is talking about. So there's a lot of data here what the author mentions of how the ancient government is actually neglecting the social se uh, this sectors. As per the periodical force survey report, around 53 percentage of the population salaried workforce does not have any social security benefits. Out of all the 100 percent of workforce, 53 percentage doesn't have any social security benefits. So if you are looking in the poorest of the 20 percentage, even out of the poorest 20 percentage, only 1.9 percentage of people have access to any kind of health benefits. And these groups come about the gig workers or the other such groups like weavers or any other rickshaw pullers as such, about 1.3 percentage of India's active labor force rarely have any access to social security benefits. So that is what the author is saying. So the author is stating that as per the Mercer's CFS ranking, uh, for ranking based on 43 countries, India's ranking is 40, which means that we are lacking behind a lot of social security system, which is not given to the unorganized or informal sectors. Now Indian policy makers, like their budget is also very much low. For addressing the informal sectors, a budget of about 22,841 crore was required. But the, in the financial year level, they just actually alloc allocated 
thousand crores. About twenty-two thousand plus crores were actually required to address this issue, but only thousand was actually given. Out of all the given to majority, like about one thousand nine hundred twenty-seven crores was not even utilized. This is cumulative, and not just the financial year eleven we are talking about. Out of the cumulative, what has been actually provided for addressing the unorganized sector, this much has not been. Used as such. If you are looking at National Social Assistance Program, as per this uh, pension of about old age poor, they'll get a, about seventy five rupees. This was actually for nineteen hundreds. So this amount that is given to the old age poor, they had to be increased. But in two thousand six, it actually came to an update of two thousand per month. We know with this all the inflation and such going on, this two hundred per month is not enough for anything. So this actually came to an end by two uh, two hundred and. 2006 and also similarly in july 2020 the cag identified that the cess which is collected especially in the case of delhi the cess which was collected about 90 94% was actually not used to address this informal sectors now we can actually look into some basic model that india can learn from so if you are looking in the brazilian model brazil general social security scheme now what how are they actually providing for the people that is something that like if you get a question like we had a previous year question asking about the gig economy so if you can actually contribute much point about an overseas about such cases where countries portray this will be a best example which you can actually provide in your answer paper so how does brazilian general social security scheme work There is a person like they actually substitute income blows for a worker. If their person is sick or met by an accident, they actually help that person by actually meeting. No, if they can't meet the full also, at least partially half, they will actually help the person meet. Even if the person there is an income loss because the worker had has been in prison, that is also met by this Brazil. Even the unemployment insurance is also paid from the worker support funds. The healthcare is also made. Even if the constitution, the Brazilian constitution has itself stated that they established that if they have a lack of funds, they will actually take from the national treasury to meet these unorganized of people to help these people. The social security benefits can be availed with simple phone call or a visit. Now you know to get a benefit or scheme in India, we need a lot of documentation. We need to wait a lot for the offers and. in any government sectors but they are just a phone call away they are actually be available with a simple phone call or a visit to bank they get the social security benefit that is how fast and efficient the brazil so uh, general social security scheme is now what can actually india do to get rise up to this we need to expand our employees provident fund organization which is actually provided to formal sector we need to expand it to the informal sectors and all and with the people who are working in the informal sectors they have to partially contribute also the employer has to partially contribute so that they could actually build this provident fund provident fund also those who are unemployed or those people who cannot work or stop working also the government should step in and actually provide so the cost of estimate of addressing at least a down 20 percentage we need about 1.37 trillion that is about point 69 percentage of our current gdp so that is this is the cause that we require now to address about 20 percentage of the poor presently in india then code of social security in 2022 as i have told you this has to be expanded to add informal sectors provide a salary framework to actually enable social security for the urban and rural poor it also include the construction workers gig economy workers and the informal uh, informal sector workers also like they are also given life insurance disability insurance accident insurance even maternity and healthcare kind of insurance and paid up capitals now e shram portal this was actually an initiative of the government e shram portal there this actually registration of such kind of informal workers now the registration has gone up to about 300 million workers in this e shram portal by which the government has a collection of data of how many people actually comes under this informal working sector while expanding coverage like they could, by this they could actually give more insurance accidental insurance disability insurance as such can be provided by the government but the problem here is that people themselves have to register and there is no contribution by their employer within this within this particular scheme so then push up for fan india labor force card and expansion of existing successful scheme then as also building up construction and uh, like schemes for construction workers other gig economic workers other 
workers as such. Now the main people who are actually affected by these kind of un unorganized informal sectors are mainly the domestic workers, mainly females and migrant workers who get abused or they are discriminated against. So particularly for this population, this category of vulnerable people, these kind of schemes are necessary. Then we have already a lot of existing schemes. So it is important that the government strengthen the existing schemes like the Employees Provident Fund, the Employee State Insurance Scheme. So these are some of the government has to take place. So in this case, if you are writing an answer, the two, three things which you need to remember is like you can quote the Brazilian, Brazilian model. You can quote some of the facts of how what is happening, how much people are in the unorganized sector and how much people doesn't get any kind of benefits. You can mention certain schemes which uh, government of India has about the Employees Provident Fund organization. You can mention the social security, uh, security scheme and then the East Trump portal. Never miss out these three if you are writing an answer based on this. Now we have the UK India relationships. Now this is a very small article, I will tell you everything in detail. There is something it specifically talks about the trade. So India UK trade has actually gone up to about from the UK sector 36 billion in 2023. That is what the trade is. There is no secret that UK and India share a thriving trade relationship which is about 36 billion in 2022. Now so if you are looking they want to actually push for free trade agreements in India. There are two, two things which you need to understand here or know here or you need to buy heart in this. So if you are looking into India UK relationships, the UK is the second large, India is the UK second largest source of investments which means that India is actually UK's second largest investor. India actually is driving about 180 new projects in UK and we actually give about 8384 new job for the UK citizens. Now if you are looking at back, UK is India's sixth largest investor. UK has about invested 34 billion dollars in India. Their average turnover of the companies here is 15 billion dollars and they have about 618 UK companies that is established in India employing about 4 lakh people, 4 lakh more, 4 plus 4 lakh people. They are employed in India. So there are two facts you should know here. India is the second largest investor in UK. UK is the sixth largest investor in India. Going apart from the trade, they are actually pushing for a free trade agreement so that both India and UK will actually benefit from this. Apart from all this trade and commerce, we have also a lot of cultural relations because over 1.6 million people actually of Indian diaspora lives in UK. There is a lot of connection. We are Bollywood, we are movies, we are culture, culture, we are trade and goods. So that is the relationship between India and UK. I am not going further into this article, but these are key some of the factors which just came up. Just remember the second and the sixth. India is the second largest investor in UK and UK is the sixth largest investor in India. Now moving on, we have the One Health. This One Health is a joint plan of action that was launched by four companies, four not uh, like four organizations. These are FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Health Organization, United, uh, United Nations Environment Program and the World Organization for Animal Health. So in this one health, it doesn't even, not only actually looks for the health of human beings, but it's look for the health of environment and the health of animals altogether. It actually health concern addressing human, animal, plant, economic interface. Now this plan is valid for about 2022-2026. Now let us look into more into this one health. So you see here everything is together, the humans, the plant, the animals. If you are damaging the environment, it's going to release a lot of uh, natural hazards and diseases by which everything will come back affecting. So all this together comes together in the scheme of one health. Now one health is an approach that recognizes that health of people is closely connected to the health of animals and our shared environment. In this purpose is to increase the collaboration in more research and sharing of knowledge at multiple levels. So the, as there is growth in human population, we are going a lot of urbanization, there is modernization, there is industrialization because of which there is a lot of stress created in the environment. With a lot of stress created in the environment, there is a lot of spread of diseases and spread of no, uh, natural hazards as such because of which it is coming back to affecting the health of humans and animals as well. So under this, the most harmful thing which I want to say is that about linked to zoonosis, that is zoonotic diseases, which are the kind of diseases that are actually spread from 
animals to humans. So that kind of disease is called a zootonic disease. The researchers say that about the 60 percentage of new emerging diseases are actually infected in humans are zoonotic in nature. We can actually talk about the COVID. Like this initiative comes after COVID because they don't want to actually address any kind of such pandemics in the future. So to prevent such kind of pandemics in the future, there need to be a lot of collaboration or of share with a lot of research and knowledge sharing is actually required to kind of provide, prevent such kind of COVID-19 such pandemics in the future. So you can portray like the zootonic disease, COVID-19 also emerged from that. Other includes bird flu, Ebola, rabies, as such. They actually mention about a framework, what they should do, a four stage approach about communication, collaboration, coordination and integration. This communication is between different ministry set up so that they could keep updated among themselves of what is happening. Then there is collaboration between different ministries and such so that there is experts, expertise in order to translate this diseases could be actually met. Then clarifying the roles and responsibilities of different sectors. Then coordination between different agencies and initiative to achieve One Health in India. In this we can actually quote the example of National One Health Mission which we have in India. Then integration. It needs to integrate and develop synergy between these programs and these sectors. So a policy framework is actually required to address such kind of this so that all the ministries and all the departments could come together there would be more resource allocation, there is more use of this allocated resource and there is more sharing and there is more compatibility in the resource which we, can, which we can actually achieve. So that is a glimpse about the One Health. You should know what is One Health, what it is dealing with, the interconnection between people, animal and the environment and this kind of four-way strategy what they are actually building up. Then we have Astra air to air missile, we are actually coming into a prelims portion and Astra indigenous is actually a beyond missile range air to air missile. Now this is actually operates along with the light compact aircraft Tejas. Now this was actually successfully carried out from Goa. It has achieved the altitude of about, it is from the release from an altitude of about 20,000 feet. And now this Astra air to air missile is actually used to engage and destroy highly maneuvering supersonic targets as such. This would impact India's combat powers and help with indigenous developed technologies like Tejas. So you see here this is Tejas and this is the Astra, Astra, Astra which is actually released from Tejas. Its range is about 70 kilometers. It is indigenously designed and developed by DRDO. So that is on this uh, Astra's uh, missile. Then you have national curriculum framework. Now they have bought about new curriculum. Now earlier we had the language formula about 2 plus 1. We should know that up till about 8 we actually learned 3 language. If you are like in Kerala we have Malayalam, Hindi and English. So when 9th and 10th you can actually choose any 2 languages. You can either go for English and other one common language either Malayalam or Hindi. Now they have actually bought it to 3 plus 2. In 9th and 10th you need to learn 3 languages. One can be English and the other two has to be Indian languages. When you go to 12th you can actually reduce that to 2 subjects. The one need to be about Indian origin. Which means that they are actually pushing for the improvement of the vernacular and region, region languages. The NCF that is the National Curriculum Framework actually uh, wants to achieve a literacy level of linguistic capacity that the, all the students in the upcoming future they can actually they will be more linguistically proficient that each student can actually know two to three languages in general. Now and also update is that when we were in 10, we can only take the board exam once. Now they can actually take the board exam once or twice. If your mark is not good enough in the first, you can actually take the second attempt. This has a positive and negative effect. Sometimes it may actually reduce the pressure over the children. Sometimes it can actually increase the pressure over the children because it spans over a lot more time. So this has two main updates that actually came along with this article. Now moving on, we have our last topic that is the Wagner group. So this, uh, there was, was a recent plane crash in Russia, it consists of, uh, or, uh, it was uh, about 10 people actually died. Out of this 10 there was an important person known as the Yevgeny Prigozhin. Prigozhin, he was actually killed along in, the, in this accident and along 9 others. With him there was actually his uh, second right hand man called the Utkin. They both are actually found to be dead, it is not actually confirmed if they are actually dead but there is actually 
a slight of concern and this has been given out by the Russian ministry. About 10 people, all the 10 people who were in this crash actually died. So if you are looking back into this Wagner group, this Prigozhin was actually the person who created this Wagner group or this also called as the PMC Wagner. So they are actually a group of private military, military contractors who are in connection with the Russian government. They are fighting for a lot of areas in Africa, especially like in the um, Mali region, Sudan region. These people are private military contractors who take up contracts in such kind of area. Now, they had initially starting about uh, 5,000 fighters and which actually gradually expanded to about 50,000 soldiers. But there is recently there was some controversies or some debates going on between this Wagner group and the Russian because this Wagner group were the first line of defense in the case of Ukraine. So they don't want to do this anymore. So there was a lot of controversy and issue. So this person, he and the second in command, Utkin were the first and second of this organization. So there is also a problem like they are stating that the Russian groups actually targeted to kill them. The Russians knew that these both were actually traveling by the uh, plane and thus targeted the flight. So there is a lot of controversies and issues going on with this article. So it is a very small one. Now moving on to a practice question. I have one practice question. We had a parliamentary democracy based on the British model. But how does our model differ from their model? So as regards legislation, the British parliament is supreme over sovereign but in India the power of parliament to legislate is limited. We know that this is actually correct. They have the supreme power, the parliament has the supreme power but in India our constitution actually limits the working power of the parliament. In India matters related to the constitutionality of amendment of an act of the parliament are referred to the constitutional bench of the supreme court so that they could know if the law or the act made is unconstitutional or constitutional a lot. So both these statements are correct. So that is it for today. This was one of the practice question. We will meet again tomorrow. You can get the PDF from the telegram channel Gallant IAS. Thank you. I will be seeing you again tomorrow. Thank you.